Hi everyone, so today's lecture is about uh, mostly unsupervised analysis and we'll end with a bit of supervised analysis uh, and we'll be using our breast cancer TCGA data set that we developed earlier in the course. In particular, um, over the next two lectures, we're going to look uh, at k-means clustering as one type of super unsupervised approach um, to try and discover subtypes in breast cancer data, our transcriptomic set. And then we'll switch gears and look at linear regression for predicting patient outcome from the same data set. Just to, um, uh, with respect to the subtypes, you might want to revisit lecture three where I had uh, about 45 minutes of background into breast cancer. And in, in particular, I spoke a little bit about breast cancer subtypes. This is a, a, um, a relatively famous figure uh, from Parker A. L. in Chuck Peru's lab in North Carolina from around 2010. And, and these are the so-called uh, PAM50 breast cancer subtypes of luminal A, normal-like, luminal B, HER2 enriched, and basal-like. Uh, actually, you'll recognize these 50 genes here. They're the 50 genes that we have in our data set. I remember, recall that I didn't uh, give you all of the TCGA data set because there's something like 20,000 genes. I just gave you 50 of them just for space reasons. Um, but you might, again, re revisit lecture three to, to refresh yourself about why we're looking for subtype and what they mean. Um, and uh, the second part, when we look at supervised analysis with regression, um, we're going to be predicting outcome, specifically the number of days to death post-diagnosis uh, for, for women with breast cancer. Um, so that you might want to t look back to lecture six, where I started to build models, if you recall. Uh, in, that, in that case, I was building them to predict or classify tissue type, not outcome, but the principle is the same, and you might want to take a look there. Okay, so I'm going to switch over now to our studio, and we'll work from there today. As you can see here, I'm in lecture 19, project uh, clustering. Um, inside of source, I put um, a number of files. Today, we're mostly going to be focusing on this k-means uh, notebook file here. Uh, and um, the next with regression will be here in this regression notebook. Um, the data, well, I've, it's just a standard one, the small bracket. Uh, and I don't think that there's anything else that you need there. Okay, so um, I'm going to actually switch over to the uh, notebook. Let's see if I can do that smoothly. So this is the R notebook for K-means clustering. Um, uh, first, we start by loading some libraries that we'll need uh, throughout the um, following session. And like I said, we'll be using the TCGA data set here. Um, okay, so as you know, there's 50 genes. Um, uh, in the data set. And we could plot, let's say, two or three variables pretty easily uh, at a time across the all observations rows. That's not a problem. So that would just be like a GG plot call to a scatter plot like this with ESR1, say, along the um, x axis. Actually, we're going to work in log coordinates here become, as we have done in the past for its expression data. And we could put, um, for example, um, CDC20 as a coloring. So bright blue is uh, a lot of expression, and dark is low expression. And maybe RB2, that's the synonym for HER2 on the y-axis, right? And we could look for relationships between these variables that way. But yeah, even just looking at, say, um, triples, that's a lot of, um, of triples to go through. That would be something like, um, basically 50 cubed divided by 2, 50 times 50 is what, 2,000, 25,000? Uh, it's a lot, right? So uh, you're not going to do that by hand to go through all possibilities of looking at three genes of 50 um, to, to look for relationships. But you, you can see already that there is actually an interesting relationship here. You can see that low um, CDC20 expression is somehow captured here. and uh, RB2 has a very bimodal distribution. A lot of the points are in this range here with a few points very highly expressed. But we won't go into that right now. I mean, this is just not really a solution. A visualization like this, um, gene by gene or three genes by three genes, 
It's just not really an appropriate way to find patterns in your data. And that's really what motivates an unsupervised approach like k-means clustering, because we want to let the data speak for itself and find those relationships. That's what I'm saying in this area here. Okay, so let's go back, uh, back up and work through these ideas methodically. Uh, well, first of all, let's consider just clustering one variable. Uh, okay, so I'm going to show you some code for that. Um, now, you might say, well, what does that mean to cluster one variable? Okay, so, um, well, it could be nothing or trivial in a sense. If, if you look here, I've created a tibble uh, from 1,000 random uh, normal variates. So these are 1,000 variates. So one, think of that as 1,000 examples. Uh, it pulled or generated from a normal distribution with mean zero. You can see here there's a, a zero mean and a variance of one. Uh, that means the spread of the points. And so uh, I can plot that here with ggplot, standard way of the histogram, and I can see my points are plotted uh, in a very nice normal distribution, which isn't surprising because we've used the R for random norm. So R norm is a way of generating random variates from the distribution that you want, uh, well, the specific uh, mean and variance. Well, that's not very interesting. There's not too much to cluster there because it's really all the points are centered around this one mean of zero. But what if what about look at this distribution here, distribution two? Again, I'm, I'm generating a tibble, but now my variates uh, are in two parts. The first 1,000 points come from a normal distribution like before of 0 and 1. So I'm going to ask that, I'm going to ask God to pass me 1,000 points generated from this randomly from this distribution with mean 0 and 1. Okay, I'm going to say right now that I plotted it down here. So that's the plot for this guy here. And you can see that these points are, again, uh, distributed around 0 in much the same way that um, they were over here. Now, uh, however, the second 1,000 points of this district uh, of, of, of my um, my variable are generated across uh, according to a different distribution. Here, my mean of the distribution is five, but my ver my standard deviation is again one. And so, the second 1,000 points are over here, and you can see that they're centered on five, and they have basically the same shape because my variance in both cases was one. So here, actually, um, if this was like gene expression data, the first guy, I'd say, well, that gene is not very interesting, well, or it's, it's not very complicated, at least, because it's just centered, it just basically follows one normal distribution. But in this case here, sometimes the gene follows this distribution, and sometimes it follows the latter distribution. So, you know, there is sort of a, um, a natural idea of, uh, um, splitting this, this, this joint distribution into its two components. And of course, it can get more complicated. For example, in distribution 3, the first 1,000 points come from a distribution with minus 10. The second 1,000 points come from a distribution with 0. And the third come from a distribution with 5. The, notice that they all have the same variation. So they have the, that means that they have the same shape. All I've done is shifted that normal distribution up or down the x-axis. And again, so this is like, a, uh, I guess, a, a ternary or, um, distribution, right? Um, I have three different peaks. And so that if that was a gene, it, it would suggest that maybe there's three fundamental levels of expression for that gene. And I could split them into my three groups. But the fourth one shows a more realistic situation where, again, I have three distributions this one, which is exactly like before, and then these two. But now their variance has increased to 1.5, and that means that they spread out. So instead of being like towers, they start to become fatter, wider. And when they become wider, they start to overlap. And so these points in here, we're never really sure if they belong, if they were generated, well, if they were, if they were part of this distribution or whether they're part of that distribution because the two distributions um, you know, overlap in essence, right? Okay, and that's often the case uh, is that we don't have clear separation in the expression patterns. These things uh, melt together to some extent. Some, some extent.
So here's a question for you to think about. Where would you draw lines in each of the four panels that separate the clusters? And which points are the hardest to classify? I think we know the answer to that. It's always going to be the ones that, that fall um, in between two distributions, right? Or could, have, could belong to either one. Okay, so uh, that's one dimension, not too interesting, but still already uh, non-trivial in many ways. And the second w step would be to consider two variables. So we can switch here to sc scatter plots instead of histograms um, because we can draw our two dimensions, right? Okay, so it's really important that you understand these figures because uh, it's the basis for k-means clustering. So the first one here is easy again. It's basically saying, I have a distribution. It's a two-dimensional normal distribution. In the first dimension along the x-axis, uh, my one, I, I generate 1,000 points with mean zero, which you can see it's mean zero there, and standard deviation of one. So it's basically the same distribution as the previous slide, but um, you don't see it because it's not a histogram and the points are scattered along this y axis. Now the second um, dimension is again the same distribution, but it's in that dimension. So basically you could think here of this being sort of, if you were to um, uh, look at it in three dimensions, it would be like a mountain that's sort of like uh, um, where a lot of the points are around this zero, zero, right? And then they, they, they sort of tail off in all of these dimensions this way, okay? So all those points, one could argue, belong to this one distribution that's centered, the centroid of that is basically zero, zero. Okay, we know that because we're playing God here and we can generate these distributions. Okay, so here's a slightly more complicated example where I have two clusters in two dimensions. So my X now, it's split into two, the points are split into two um, distributions. The first 1,000 points are split, uh, uh, sorry, are, are distributed around uh, mean five with standard deviation one. Okay, so that's this um, cluster of points. And the second one is distributed around minus five, and that's this, this um, cluster up here. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's, that's how they, they fall that way. Now this is along the x-axis, right? And you can see that in the x-axis, well, not, you can't see very well, but you, you can, you, 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 well, you can see the code, you can see the code here, is that along the x-axis, these two distributions are the same. They've just been shifted by minus 10 or 10 points between them. Now the y-axis um, that complements them, this first set of points are centered around minus 10, and they have a larger um, variance. So they're broader in this dimension than that dimension. I don't think we can really see it so well there, but I, it, it should be the case that the, 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 vari the, standard, uh, the variance here is wider than this direction. And the second one, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, what's happened there? This is minus 10. Oh no, I'm right, that's right, sorry, this, this is correct. It doesn't have the number here, I'm sorry, it's seven. And it has very small variance of 0.5, and that's why it's, um, it's tight, this dimension, so it looks more cigar-shaped, right, uh, and not round. In, in this dimension, it has a variance of uh, 0.5. In this dimension, it has a variance of 1, and that's why you get that cigar shape. All right, three, three, three clusters in two dimensions, no problem. So you can see here, uh, I have three clusters. They're, they're pretty separate, right? You don't see, it's close, like there's some points here, you know, that point, it could come from this distribution or it could come from that distribution. We can't really be sure. Um, that point, that point, well, that's definitely from this distribution. Well, I should never say definitely because clearly with what you could get a point out here that actually belongs to this distribution is possible. It's just not very probable, right? Because the tails of the normal distribution approach zero pretty quickly. So you're not going to get these points way, way, way out there. But it's possible. There, there's some probability associated with that event. Okay, so um, yeah, here, these three distributions, one centered on minus 10 and plus, what is that, um, 
minus 10 and 7, right? So it's minus 10 in the x dimension and 7 in the, in the y dimension. The second one is 0, 0 with um, a, a variance of 2 in both dimensions. And finally, um, it's 5, 2, minus 6, 2, and that's this guy down here, I believe, right? So that would be uh, 5, yeah, 5 and 2. So it has a pretty, pretty, pretty big standard deviation in this direction, and minus 6 and 2. Uh, it's kind of strange. It, it seems to here on, on the plot, at least, that um, uh, it, it, the variance isn't as big here in this dimension, but it is. I guess it's a bit of an optical illusion or something. Okay, and finally, oh, wait, no. I'm sorry. It's because this point here is 5, 1. I was looking at distribution 4. This is distribution 3. That's why it's not an optical illusion. It's, it's 5, 1 in this dimension. Okay, so it has your standard variance, but in the second dimension, it has a, um, a tighter variance of, of 0.05. So uh, minus six there, so that makes a lot more sense. Uh, okay, um, and then distribution four, really sorry about that. Uh, the only difference between it and distribution three is that I've increased the variance. So for example, from minus 10, one, this guy up here, I've increased it um, minus 10. Uh, right, I, I've increased the variance in this, um, in this dimension, so now it's two, right? So this from here to here was a variance of one, and now it gets broader uh, with a variance of two. Uh, the second one, the second cluster guy in the middle is this guy here. It's still centered on zero as before, zero and zero, zero and zero. That hasn't changed. But what has changed is that the variance was one and two, and now I've made it two and two. And you can see now that, that these points on this side are blurring into this third, this third cluster. And the third cluster is still centered on five and minus six. See, five and minus six. All that's changed is I went from a variance of one and 0 0.5 in the x and y uh, dimensions respectively to a variance of two and two. And what that now causes is that these two distributions overlap. So we're never really sure if we were to pick a point in here, let's say that point there, has it been generated from this distribution or generated from that distribution? Now you could maybe say, well, you could ask the question, why? Why is this even interesting? Why do we need to do, do that? And if you go back to our iris example from last class, for example, we had this overlap between the red and the blues. I can't remember the names, which ones were which, but um, that's what happens, right, with real data is that uh, although, let's say, you know, um, the VersaColor generally had this distribution, some of those points overlapped with the, um, the other um, iris, right? And our challenge was then to sort of deconvolute, well, was exactly to deconvolute that, right, to factorize these points back into their respective distribution so that we would have a classifier of irises based on their different um, observable phenotypes. So what about three genes? Uh, it's no problem to um, generate them and still with three dimensions we can use color um, to visualize. So the first one here, that's always the simplest one. I just created that cluster of points in all three dimensions, x, y, and z, with the same variance. And here, z is, is represented by color, so we have those guys that would be like very highly expressed at blue, and those guys lowly expressed at minus two. And you can see that there's no real rhyme or reason to that. It's a real scatter of points. So in three dimensions. So you can think of the z, of course, as sort of zooming in or zooming out from you in three dimensions. A second example um, here, I've, what I've done is I've created two, two clusters, uh, of course, and in this cluster over here, Z has very high expression. In fact, I think it was given a four, right? So I guess you could think of it coming towards you in the three dimensions, whereas uh, dark colors are, the negative colors are going away from you, right? They're, they're on the other side of the uh, origin. 
Okay, so it has a minus four. Um, so, but all that really means is that those points are um, are distributed with variance, right? So they still have, for example, these guys at four. They still, uh, in three dimensions, they're they're um, scattered around that point four. So some are three, some are five, etc. And they're right around that. But um, it's still a, a, that it's it's important to visualize that properly, right? That the points are still in in the third dimension. They have depth, different depths. Okay, so then, um, well, some other examples of the three clusters here. What have I done? I, I've just added basically, in the first case, this cluster over here, minus 10. Um, I've added also uh, a, a Z dimension of five, so it's coming towards you. Okay, that's why uh, um, you're seeing these uh, light dots okay and um uh, no i'm sorry that's uh what am i saying this is it's always confusing this is minus 10 right that's this minus 10 in the x-axis now the y-axis is seven that's this guy right that's the mean there and the z-axis is minus four um right so no, it requires a bit more explanation so so these points, the first 500 points um, are uh, going away from you. And you don't really see it, but those points in the background have low colors of minus 4. The second 500 points, right, these 500 points are coming towards you with a value of 4 and a standard and a variance of 1. Okay, so... Uh, if you were to sort of um, look sideways at this, you would see that there's two clusters of the points. One is at, um, what did I say that was? It was at uh, uh, minus four, and the other one is at plus four. Okay, so, and, and both in each cluster has 500 points. In total, that's 1,000, just like, uh, the number of points for x and y. So I, I've split that cluster into two um, parts using the third dimension. But you don't see that split, of course, um, because you, when you look at it from the bird's eye view here, just at the x and y planes. Um, now the second cluster, it's it's focused at 0, 1. That's boring. And for y, it has 0, 2. That's why you see a bit more spread in this dimension. And the z, um, it... Uh, I split it into three. So now I have those guys that are coming towards you, those guys that are far away, and those guys that are at the um, right at the um, origin. So there's, if you were to turn this sideways, you would see three clusters, three-dimensional clusters, uh, with about 333 points each. And finally, the fourth cluster down here, well, it's analogous to the second one where they start to overlap. But now um, with my Z, what I've done is I've, um, I don't think I've really done anything too interesting here. Uh, the first one up top is just, I split, yeah, what did I do here? I, I didn't, um, uh, where am I here? Uh, yeah, I didn't do anything very interesting with Z. I just created 3,000 points and they're all following the same distribution. Um, with zero, but they have a very large standard, uh, a very large variance of seven. Okay, so uh, yeah, what happens is that that large variance blurs those points between the neighboring distributions, and that becomes um, a challenge. Okay, uh, so so this variance, you know, you think about it, like, you know, if you had three irises, for example three types of viruses or strains or species, I'm not sure what the right term is there, I guess strains. If, if, there, if one strain is always red and there's no variance on that, it would just be easier to classify, right? If it was the only species or strain that was red, it would be a great marker. But, you know, maybe sometimes it goes more pinkish or even very light pink to a white and other ones are around white or a little bit pinkish then it's going to, that's not the best marker, right? The variance um, plays into how um, uh, um, specific your, your uh, 
marker or your, your, your criteria is, criterion. So we could do this in higher dimensions. It's just that it's very hard to visualize. Uh, I guess you could use time somehow in R to, you know, on top of this. But, um, well, nothing really changes, though. I, I, it's just that, you know, you could have, instead of three um, uh, dimensions that you're interested in, you could have ten. Um, for example, you know, what we're going to see later today is that each dimension is one gene, right? So we're, we're, we're trying to basically understand a tumor by looking at one gene, it may not tell the whole story. So we look at a second gene, and that would be Y. And if we include another gene, that would be Z. And the distributions that we're putting into here, um, 7, 2, 0, 2, etc., that's the distribution of each gene, X, Y, and Z. Of course, we're not limited to just studying three genes at a time. We could study 50 genes or 1,000 genes or whatever we have um, computational resources to look at. So, but um, uh, clearly visualization kind of tails off. We can't really use it at those higher dimensions. And, and that's really what motivates these unsupervised um, uh, approaches like k-means uh, and other competing algorithms. It's based, you know, and, and high dimensional data is the norm now, right? I mean, when Amazon collects parameters about you as a consumer, they're collecting all sorts of information, um, not just three things. There might be a, a hundred different uh, parameters that they track you with. I believe Google's, uh, I think each one of you, you can go to your, your, your Gmail account and you can access Google's evaluation of you from a marketing perspective. They, they, they try to pigeonhole you. It's kind of fun to look at. And um, I think that they keep, I think 47 to 50 variables about you. Um, what they estimate from your behavior, et cetera, and what they've observed. So, so they're keeping many um, variables, and, and their analysis wants to use all those variables at the same time, not restricted down just to your age or your, your sex or whatever else, right? They want to look at all of these things together. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess there's another little point here. Sorry, there's a typo there. But uh, um, in, this, in this plot here, uh, in some sense, the variable Z doesn't support the clustering. So, um, yeah, I guess um, I'll skip that for now. But uh, sometimes some genes won't really add to your understanding, right? So that's, I think, kind of makes intuitive sense. If, you, uh, if you're Amazon trying to an an analyze your buying, pro uh, you know, somebody's buying patterns, um, some variables might be really relevant, like their hobby, or their, their work, or their age, and other variables may not be at all relevant in some queries, right? I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. So you could say, well, why, why, then, why, why is it one of the 50 things they track about you? Well, maybe in other queries, that is a relevant piece of information, but it's not always relevant, right? So um, in some analysis, you don't want to use all the variables that you've captured about the individuals, right? Okay. And this, that, that would be like in the breast cancer data. You're not going to use 20,000 genes for every question that you look at. You're going to select a few from it. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is shift gears. I'm going to go to the um, iPad and show you the k-means algorithm at a high level. Uh, and then we're going to come back here and look at the code in R for running the k-means algorithm. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at the k-means algorithm. This is kind of a fun algorithm for doing. It's quite straightforward, yet powerful. So we're given input in a format that we're pretty familiar with by this point. We have our design matrix X, okay, and um, that we might have d dimensions to describe our data. So for us, it's going to be gene expression uh, over our 50 genes. So d will be 50, and this is the number of samples. For example, in our TCGA data set. Okay. Now, recall this is the design matrix. We don't, and it's, undis, un, it's unsupervised analysis. So we don't have this output or response variable Y. We don't have the answer. Here, we're letting the data speak for itself to find patterns. Now, I, I'm going to use D equal to 2, but of course, this can be generalized to any um, dimensionality. It's just hard to draw. 
and higher than d equal to 2. And I'll start with something small like 30 points that I've drawn here. Now, here you can see that the points basically are very highly suggested of, of four clusters, maybe five. Depends what that singleton out there is. Is that its own cluster? Is that just a stray from one of these clusters, etc.? Um, how do we know how many clusters there are? How do we know there should be any clusters at all? We don't, right? We're, we're taking a shot in the dark in a sense, trying to find if there's structure in the data. In fact, a lot of the first clustering algorithms like k-means came, came from astrophysicists back in the 15 and 1600s who were simply staring at the night sky and asking if there was any rhyme or reason to the way that stars are organized. And of course there are things like the, the uh, Milky Way, etc. Okay, so um, yeah, that's just repeated from above. So basically we want to assign our endpoints to clusters. Um, now, we don't know uh, beforehand how many clusters. We can't visualize it. We have the convenience because d equal to two here that we can visualize it. And we can kind of see right away that there should be four clusters. But in general, there is no easy way to determine how many clusters you have um, beforehand. So that's a you know, kind of a tricky conceptual point, but you can do different things like try different values of k or try every value of k uh, up to some, let's say, um, the number of points. So you can't have more clusters than the number of points. Of course, uh, you could have one cluster for every point, for example. Um, I'm not sure that's very informative, but certainly that's possible. So our intuition is that we're going to create k centroids uh, and assign all points to their nearest centroid. So a centroid is just math geek uh, terminology for the center. So if you think of, of these guys as being a cluster, you think of what, what would the center would be. What's the average point? So they're kind of outliers, right? So I think the center of these points here is somewhere in there. I'll give the formal equation for it in a, in a minute. Okay, so how do you measure then distance? That's a really important concept in k-means. So we need to know how far each point is to different centroids. So how do we calculate that? Well, I think it's even grade school uh, for calculating the distance between two points in the Cartesian plane, two dimensions. Uh, all I need to know is the distance um, vertically, which is going to be 9 minus 6, 3, which is 6, and 12 minus 2, which is 10. Then the Pythagorean Pythagorean theorem tells me it's going to be uh, the square root of 136, right? Okay, so now, of course, if we have multidimensional data, uh, you know, like three-dimensional data, for example, how do you compute the distance between two points? And the answer is that nothing changes, really. It's just a straightforward generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. If I have a point here for at position 3 in the x-axis, 9 in the y-axis, and on the z-plane, uh, 0 in the third dimension. And this point down here is at 12, uh, is at 12 for the x-axis, 4 for the y-axis, and 4 for the z-axis. All I need to do is just um, do the same thing as I would with the Pythagorean theorem, and I would uh, simply sum up um, the squares of differences and square root it. So for example, the distance between point I and point J um, across their dimensions is we, we sum from one to the number of dimensions D for each dimension, let's say beginning with the X dimension, then the Y, then the Z. You, you take the, dif the difference between X sub I in that dimension and X sub J and you square root it uh, overall after you've done doing that in all three dimensions, you take the square root. So this at the beginning would be uh, 10 squared. The second dimension would be 6 squared. And the third dimension in this case would be, I believe, 4 squared. And so you would take the square root of um, uh, 136 plus 16. Okay, that's, that's what your distance between those points would be. Okay, so the first step of the algorithm is the initialization, and we only do this once. The basic idea is that we're going to choose k centroids randomly. So again, centroids is just uh, mathematical jargon to mean the center of the um, uh, of the uh, of something of a space. 
So because we decide there's going to be four centroids, I just plop completely arbitrarily four points down, these four red points. And so I'm going to use red to label the centroids, and blue are going to be to represent the observations. Okay. And that's all there is to step zero. I just chose four random points. This, there's no logic to why I put them here. They could have been anywhere. Now, step one is that for each point, I compute the distance from it to each centroid. So let's imagine I'm this, this point here. I'll compute the distance to this centroid, to this centroid, to this one, and to this one. And clearly, my closest one is this guy here. And so, I, in, in essence, I declare myself loyal to the allegiance of this centroid. This point here, I would measure the distance to all centroids, but clearly that's out of the game, and that's out of the game. So it's going to be between this point and that point. It looks a bit closer to this point than it is to that point, and so I, I, this, this point would declare allegiance to this uh, centroid here. Clearly these guys are all close to him, to this guy. Now all these blue points are closest to this centroid. That would be close between this centroid and that, but I think this one would be a bit closer. And this point here is seemingly a bit closer to this centroid than to this one, that one, or that one. And so you get the idea. So basically what this gray outline means is the, um, it, it, it basically defines this space that, belong, uh, that declares allegiance, like a boundary um, that that uh, denotes what um, centroid each point belongs to. Okay, so that's pretty easy, right? And again, the distances are just computed by that generalization of Pythagorean theorem for the Euclidean distance. Now, uh, what we need to do now is, in the step two, is to update the centroids. So basically, now that everybody's, these guys, these um, six points have declared allegiance to this centroid, let's call it mu1, I need to shift mu1 to be at the center of those six points. And I use this red x to indicate the updated position. So it used to be here, and it should move down a little bit because it won't move right into the middle of this cluster because this blue point sort of pulls it back that way. But this would end up being something similar to kind of where the, the center would be. Now the formal, edu uh, the formal equation for that, the updated uh, centroid, is a weighted, basically you take um, the size of the cluster, and for each uh, dimension, you calculate the distance and take the average for um, to that. Uh, the a so in the first dimension, let's say x, uh, you compute the average distance that each point uh, is from the red, and then you, in the second dimension, y. This is the second dimension. You would compute how far it is to that same um, uh, y-intercept. Uh, I'm sorry, actually this would be, yeah, no, that way that's correct. And you take the average, and that's what defines this point here. Same thing here. Originally this red guy's way out in space, but it'll probably move somewhere in here because it's going to have to, it can't go too far down here. It'll be shifted a bit up this direction because of this outlier. And this point, I guess, would move somewhere here. Um, it's pulled a little bit in this dimension by that guy. And, and this red guy here is going to get pulled strongly back to the middle of these blue points here. Okay. All right. So now, uh, after that's done, um, and you've updated your, the centroids to these four locations, you go back to step one. And, that, and we're, we're just going to repeat that until there's no change. In other words, no point switches centroids in one step, we're finished. So what happens next? So this is now drawn with the, the new um, centroid locations from the previous page. Now, these points will all declare allegiance to this guy. Um, just go up here. Now this point here is going to be, because this guy shifted this direction, this point is going to now, and this guy actually came closer to him too. So this guy is going to change teams and go over there. And now you see that this point is now part of this um, country. Um, I think that this doesn't change. That hasn't changed at all. And I'm not sure. All oh, right. So this guy also changed now to this team. Why did that happen? Because um, I think that 
Now that this red point moved closer, right, now it's very close to that point, right? And this moved a little bit closer to, but nothing as dramatic as that. And so what you get is a, a new boundary there. And um, now we can update the centroids. So presumably this point will move a little bit more towards here. Uh, this point is probably going to move a little bit more over here, represented there. This point will probably stay kind of the same because that point's still an outlier. And um, this point uh, will basically stay the same. And now, um, uh, if we um, read, ask well, who's closest to whom, I don't think anything changes. That point didn't change, so that's not going to change in ways. This point hasn't changed, so that, this, this point won't change from one country to the other. And I don't think any of these points will change. And so we, we've converged to an answer. And so now that learning algorithm, the k-means, has found these four clusters in our data. All right, here's a slightly more complicated example. And the only thing that's changed here is where I put down my original centroids. I'm still using k equal to 4, but I put them down a little bit differently, and it can make a difference. Um, okay, it's just to show you here. I, I, in the first example, I put down my centroids uh, like here. These two are close and down there. And now, my in this example, I have them here, 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 and here. So one's moved. This guy's moved down here. This guy's moved over. And there's this new point down there. All right. Um, so we know how it goes now. We have to pick our point. So I guess this guy here has chosen this guy slightly closer. This guy only has one point. Um, this guy has reached out to this. These two points are deemed closer to this centroid than this centroid, etc. Right? And now we update our centroids. Um, so, for example, I, I apply this equation and I'm going to shift my, my mu's. It looks like this guy should come down a little bit. This guy's going to come a little bit over there, but it's going to be still held by this guy a bit. This guy should come right in the thicket of that, and this guy, because there's only one point, will sit right on top of that point. And that's what I've drawn in purple here, um, trying to eyeball it, okay? And now it looks something like this, okay? And now we have to um, recalculate our boundaries. So a lot of things have changed. If I go back to here, we had this peninsula. This guy was uh, um, a legion to that guy. But now, because this point moves right into the middle of this, that guy is certainly going to change teams. Um, so that changes, right? And what else? Before, these two points were pledging allegiance to mu1, but because mu1 moves down over here, and this guy moves over to that side, it's, um, it's going to become, well, into there. It's going to attract these two into this side, and that's represented here. Now we have this big cluster. Um, this, actually this is two different clusters, I should draw that, I'm sorry. Uh, let me see. Okay, it's like that, they're not the same thing. I don't know why I did that. Okay, and um, uh, so this is just basically after I've updated. And, and now um, I have to recalculate who everybody's closest to. That point's still going to be closest to mu4. Nothing's going to change. Nothing changes with mu3 right here uh, from, from that scenario up to here. Uh, nothing's changed. Mu1's in here, but none of these guys are going to start to become, um, to, to pledge allegiance there, and nor this. So this, this set's going to stay the same. And this set is going to start to stay the same, right? And now we're in this situation. Uh, uh, we're in this situation here. Uh, forget that thing. And we're done. Um, my mu's are updated and nothing has changed and so I have convergence. But now um, that guy uh, is a, a cluster of just one point. Okay. So that's the k-means algorithm. All right. And now we're going to go back to our studio and show how to use that on the gene expression. All right. So we're back in our studio. And uh, we want to pick up where we left off now that we understand the k-means algorithm. Um, here we are. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to use the, um, the third 
distribution above, this, this one here with three clusters in two dimensions as my example here. Um, I think I've just copied and pasted this directly as, as above, so it's, nothing has changed from there. Okay, so you know that example. The only thing I've, I've modified is I put um, a vector, a, a variable called truth, meaning because um, we're playing God here, we know which cluster each point belongs to. And so basically for the first 1,000 points, um, this, these guys here, and this is their Y and the Z, that's, they're split into 500, 500 in the Z dimension. They all belong to cluster zero. That's this cluster up here. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it cluster A. And I'm just gonna basically um, put the, this is the repeat integer. So I'm gonna repeat uh, A a thousand times. And that's going to be basically for the first cluster, this guy. And then the, this, these thousand points for the X, Y, and Z, the Z split into three um, components of 333 each. I'll label B, and then um, in the last 1,000 entries, right, for X, Y, and Z, I will put a C to represent this cluster down here. So that's the truth, right? Because we generated the data, we know what the answer is. What we hope is that the k-means algorithm will discover that all by itself, right? That it will also realize that all, which it'll basically assign every point correctly to um, its right gener generated cluster. And that's how we'll measure it afterwards. So to do that, I can use the k-means function in R. It's, it's built in. Um, I'll save the results to results. I'm going to pump this three or pipe it into a select. I can't send it the truth, right? That would not be fair. I, we wouldn't want to give it the truth. So here I'm selecting out the truth variable, right? That's, that's definitely, you need to do that. And I'm asking for k equal to three here, which I, I know we know it's three, so as a starting point. And it'll compute very quickly, and it'll converge. So then I can look at the output from my um, results, and I'll get uh, I'll see right off the top that there's been some errors because I have one class with 90, 993 elements, not 1,000, and another one with 1,007. Although the second one looks pretty promising. Okay, so um, here. They labeled the, the algorithm labeled the first 1,000 elements as cluster two. Um, that would correspond to our, I guess, our B, right? Uh, sorry, our, our A, our A. It's the first 1,000 elements. And you get some measure of fit that we can skip over for now and look at some other, and there's other um, statistics associated with um, uh, the um, results. At the end of our result vector, we see that they're calling them as three, so that would be our C. Um, the, now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to modify my tibble this three. I'm going to add something from the, the output from the k-means, which is the results vector. That's this vector here. So each of one, my 3,000 entries gets either a two, a one, or a three. And so now we can compare our truth with its predicted um, uh, assignments in a, I think the easiest way is visually here. Um, so here, I, my ggplot looks at this three. My x-axis here is the um, x from the cluster, the y, and the color is z, exactly like as before. But now what I've done here is I've used facet grid um, by truth along this axis and um, that's, you see here, A, B, and sorry, truth actually is here, the Y, A, B, and C. That's the true values, and K means is what they predicted as 1, 2, or 3. So it's important here that A, B, and C aren't going to be 1, 2, and 3. I mean, the machine doesn't know um, enough to say that 1 should correspond to A, 2 should correspond to B. It just separates into three entities. It labels arbitrarily as 1, 2, and 3. It's our job to figure out which one matches with which. And you can see, I think, pretty clearly here that uh, everything that was truly A ends up being in 2. So that's perfect, right? It got that perfectly. But what you see here in some of, our, uh, some of the data points that were B, well, a lot of them were labeled as 1, but a few were labeled as, as C, which isn't too surprising because visually we could see that those two clusters overlapped. 
And then again, it was perfect. Uh, I guess, um, well, maybe not perfect, but I thought there was some mistakes because it had a few extra points in here. But all these points were believed to be C by us, and they're they, they're um, uh, predicted as such by the algorithm. Here's a trickier example, only because the this is this corresponds to our distribution four above, because those clusters were overlapping. This is the same as as above, but now um, and and exactly here I've labeled all the points as coming from A, B, or C exactly as before. But now, when we do this and we plot out the same thing, we can see that, um, uh, you know, here's some points. All these points are truly A, uh, but some of them get called as being twos and ones, um, but the majority are it's in threes. All of these points here um, are truly B, but th there's actually quite a lot that are um, clustered uh, either into, are called one and two. So it's really been confused there. Even some got uh, in this third category here. And the same thing, the C's are, um, looks like quite uniformly distributed across uh, about um, these two. Now, what's interesting here is that you can see that the Z, um, the dark from the Z's got pulled into this cluster and the, the light ones got pulled over here. Um, so. That's, um, it's curious to maybe figure out whether it actually uh, did, f as, as, as a kind of homework assignment, think about it a little bit. If you go back to this example and ask yourself why um, uh, this may have happened, right? So our Z scores here, um, all 3,000 were just generated by um, uh, a normal uh, centered on zero, so it, it really they're supposed to scan over. I mean, they span over all clusters, right? Um, so we have these three clusters here, but the Z doesn't really do anything. But here it seems to be sort of dividing on the Z value, so it's definitely got a bit confused. So it's not perfect. Okay, but let's return to our breast cancer data set now, um, and let's get things set up. First, I'm going to make it a little bit simpler. I'll start by um, uh, using BRCA. Uh, I'll create a variable called BRCA. I'll pipe small BRCA into a select. I'm just going to select out all the, um, the 50 genes. Okay, I don't want everything else for now. And, and then this code here, it transmutes. So it's like a mutation, but it replaces the columns. Uh, here, I'm going to add one to everything. So it basically, what this does across everything uh, and then I have this function, this um, lambda function. It's just basically, um, just think of it as a function that takes the input data and adds one to it everywhere. And that's because I'm gonna I'm gonna log this data, and some counts are zero in this matrix, and the log of zero is negative infinity, and I want to avoid that. So if I just put one, uh, add one to every score in the matrix, I avoid that problem because now after adding one to everything, I pipe it into another transmute that takes the log of everything. And so you can see at the end, all these values here are the logs of the original counts. Okay, and that's because there's such a dynamic range on these counts, like from 50,000 down to 10. So we have to log it. And then I take BRCA and I pipe it into column means. Okay, so uh, this is close to one of the assignment questions. Um, now we know for loops, so here's a really simple way to do it. Uh, I can compute this vector CM. Uh, that's going to be basically I, when I pass BRCA into into um, call means, each gene column wise, it, the mean is computed. And now for I in seek along BRCA, so in other words, I is going to go along the, the columns of BRCA. And each column of BRCA, that's the ith column, is set equal to the old ith column, and I subtract off the mean for the ith column. So remember, CM is this vector. So CM1 is going to be the call mean, the column mean of column one, and CM2 is going to be the column means of column two, etc. So here, I, I subtract off the ith column's mean from the ith column. And so now, that, now what I've done is I've centered my data um, gene-wise by the means. That's um, column centering with means. Okay. Finally, 
I pipe my bracket, well, I'm going to save it back as bracket, but I'm going to pipe my bracket in to um, a function called add column. Uh, what did this do again? What did add column do? Oh, I put a column on there, which is the ID. That's right. This just tacks a column onto the end of the matrix that uh, gives me the ID. So now the first, uh, and then I'm going to select um, ID. And it just puts, the, that's just, this, this part here just moves that ID to the head of the matrix instead of being at the end of it so I can see it better. Okay. Uh, so I just select, I select the ID and then everything else. That's, this is just, um, uh, this is just to make it look a bit nicer. And now I'm ready to go. I'm going to, um, I'm not going to pass the ID into the uh, um, uh, k-means. I, I don't want to do that. So I, I pipe bracket into select and I get rid of the ID because you don't want clustering on the ID. I mean, it, this is different than when we removed the truth before because we don't know the truth now. But um, yeah, so I don't want to cluster on the ID, of course, just the expression data. And so now, basically, what I'm passing k-means is just the, the expression of the 50 genes across all the patients. And here, um, I'm going to uh, take a guess and say that their k should be 5, that the number of centers is 5. And if I do that and I print it out, I get something that looks like this. It says that it's found um, 5 clusters. And, well, one cluster has almost half of the data in it. And one cluster is only about 150 patients. So they're not equal sized, right? There's no necessity that they become equal sized. And then you can see here um, uh, for each element uh, how it's estimating its mean, okay? And this is the assignment. So basically patient one was assigned to cluster four. Patient two was assigned to cluster three. And in total, I guess this, what, what did we have? It was something like, 1,204 or something like that samples. I can't quite remember, but just over 1,200 samples. And there's some more statistics that we'll uh, avoid um, for now. But you know, now that with so many variables, with 50 variables, we can't really do that little um, graph trick that I did before. So what I'm gonna do instead is a, common, a technique that's very common to gene expression studies. And that's um, the use of heat maps. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to make a nice heat map like this. Um, interestingly, ggplot is not the go-to tool for heat maps. It has the ability to do heat maps, but it's hard to annotate um, information onto them uh, in a nice way. And people don't really like, it's one of the few things that people don't really like about ggplot. And there's, um, heat maps have been developed in other by a lot of different groups, uh, including our group for a long time, had our own heat map code, and then other people came along and put the time into making it really good, and we just stole theirs in the end, right? The way that we work with our, right? And so P heat map, uh, it's, um, it's quite nice. You can, it's really flexible, so I would recommend that. Um, okay, so, uh, it, but it's not ggplot, so it requires a little bit of like old school R. Um, so here, let me explain it to you how it goes. I'm going to start, I'm going to create a matrix X, which is going to be my expression matrix. It's going to be the values that are in here. Um, so what, is I, what do I do here? I, I basically here, I'm just stripping off the ID, right? I, I don't want to include the ID of the patient in that expression matrix, of course. And I make it into a matrix. Now a matrix is just a two-dimensional object. In this case here, it's going to be doubles, right? It's the log expression from above. And a matrix is like a, a vector is one dimension and a matrix is two dimensions, right? So, and then the, the thing is that in my, um, or in our data, sorry, it's ours, the rows are samples and the genes are patients. Uh, sorry, yeah, no. The rows are samples and the columns are genes. But P heat map wants it reversed. They live in an alternative universe or something. I don't know. So what I'm going to do is take the transpose, and that's the T function in R, and that just switches rows for columns. So just imagine rotating your matrix 90 degrees um, counterclockwise, right? And now X is basically on the rows, we're going to have the genes, as you can see here, 
and on the columns we have the samples okay that's what that does now i need to make the column names of x right that's these guys to be the um the BRCA ids but what i've done here is i've just to make it a bit nicer it doesn't really matter because i decided to strip them anyways but i i just used the first um or or, or 15 the last 15 characters of the uh, name because they're so long right but that's that's nothing i've just assigned the names to the um the columns right now uh I can't use a tibble because this is old school, so I have to use a data frame. Same thing. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to say uh, um, my my results cluster uh, is from the um, the k-means, right? That's that's this, right? That's this vector here, uh, and that's going to be this coloring up here. Okay, so basically, cluster one through cluster five gets a color by pmap p heat map does that color assignment for us what i need to do is create this data frame that basically just gives back this long vector that says this patient was assigned pink and this patient was assigned purple etc and that's exactly what i'm doing right there i'm calling a cluster and i'm assigning it as a character i, I turn them into characters this this long vector here and now I'm, I, I need to make sure that um, they're named the right way. So I, 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 I put the names for this, my pat clusters, my patient clusters, to be the same thing as this. So that's just saying like patient Jill gets pink, patient, you know, whatever, Y gets green, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so no problem there. I think it's pretty straightforward. I just need to set that data up to pass the P heat map. In this statement here, what I'm doing um, is uh, arranging my um, patients. See, so up here, my vector is not ordered, right? So first patient has four, then a three, then a two, then a three. What I do here is I use the arrange function that you guys know to basically put all the clusters ones before all the cluster two, before all cluster three, etc. And so I've just reordered my patient clusters so that all the pinks come together, then all the purples, then all the greens, then all the blues, etc. Okay, it's just to make it a bit nicer. Um, then I need to assign my row. Um, uh, what do I do here? This, I reorder my matrix. Okay, so I reorder the columns according to the sorted order. So now they, this is what, now the matrix basically gets make sure that the, um, the columns correspond to the patient IDs, right? And that's this statement right there. It's just reordering X, okay, column-wise. And now I'm ready to go. I use the P heat map function. Not too surprisingly, I pass it this matrix X. X has row names that are the genes, and it has patient names that are the, 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 the patient IDs. And the order of those patient IDs was determined by um, these cluster numbers, okay? The second thing I do is I pass it this annotation column, and that's these colorings right here. It's just a nice way of showing that these guys are all cluster one, and these guys are all cluster purple. Um, I don't want to show the column names. I, I decided in the end that they were too long. They were pretty ugly, so I deleted them. Uh, I, I decreased my font size a little bit so we could read the gene names, and I made my color palette to be uh, navy, white, and red. So that means that those genes that are highly expressed, expressed. now remember that we median centered the columns, right? So each gene, the expression here, when it's zero, it means that it basically was its median, its mean, okay? When it's red, it means that it's higher than the mean, and blue means that it's below the mean, okay? So I just said, this is what, this is just a, um, and I think I can give to P heat map and it makes this, I can control what colors I want. So that's what you're seeing here. And, and finally, I didn't ask to cluster the columns. I let, I let the internal algorithm of P heat map cluster the rows. And this is not K means, this was done using a different type of clustering called hierarchical. But I just thought I would throw that in there to show you that the, or, the rows have been reordered so that it looks nice, right? But that's a different type of clustering. 
the columns are determined by our k-means algorithm um, that we did before. Now, just stop for a second and make sure you understand how we've incorporated the k-means output into our heat map. So it shows up right here. Um, well, actually, it starts here, right? That we create this data frame and we use results dollar sign cluster. That's from the k-means. We label it with the patient names, and then we rearrange the columns in our heat map according to that. Simple as that. And now we have this really nice heat map. And um, well, you can see right off the top that there's some really interesting expression patterns. Let's zoom in because you guys know a little bit about these things now. Here's Irby 2 is right beside Grab 7. That's a great sign because they're on the Amplicon. So is Team M44 5B. And you can see that they're pretty highly expressed uh, here. And um, I would suggest that this is probably the HER2 cluster. These are all samples that are HER2 positive. And if I come into, for example, um, let's look at some other guys. Well, here's the, I, I included the original heat map here so that you can compare. So for example, in basal like EGFR, FOXC1, MIA, they're highly expressed. And so if you find in here, where is Fox C1? It should be right about, now I'm having trouble finding it. Fox C1 is right here. I would think that these green guys are the basal subtype. Let's take a look. PGR, for example, the progesterone receptor is very uh, underexpressed, which makes sense because basal isn't um, a luminal and progesterone is very tightly correlated with um, uh, estrogen receptors. So if we find PGR in this map and go the other way, we should see that hopefully it's very down-regulated. See, there's PGR and it's down-regulated. So I'll leave it to you, but um, what we've done really in very uh, just a few lines of code uh, and the k-means algorithm is replicate what the, the Parker A. All paper found in 2010. Okay, mind you, they selected that the, we didn't select these 50 genes. They used their 50 genes, and that, that's really where a lot of their work was. But it's to show you that um, uh, these techniques are really what people use in, in you know in uh, in research. Right? It's the same. It's the same type of strategies, and the data um, is is basically um, this isn't the same data set that they use, but you can see that it doesn't carry over into other, um, it's, it's, it, it cross-validates, the, the original Parker finding cross-validates into other data sets. Okay, and I'll leave it to you um, to, to, to um, sort of investigate how much, uh, which, if, if all of these five subtypes are recapitulated in the R heat map above. Okay, so that's, that's K-means. Um, that's our uh, example of an unsupervised learning approach. And the next step will now be to look at a supervised technique.